Well, if you have your Bibles with you, let me encourage you to hold them up right now and repeat after me what we believe about this book. This is God's Word. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. It is the supreme source of truth for what we believe and how we live. Now and open up your copy of God's Word with me to 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 1. Marriage is without a doubt one of the greatest gifts that God has given to mankind. When Adam was in that perfect Eden called paradise, God said it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper that is suitable for him, that is just right for him. And God did that when he caused this deep sleep to come over Adam. And with great care, God took one of Adam's ribs and he formed Eve, this perfect helpmate. And when that surgery was all over and Adam woke up, and this is my, par this is my paraphrase, he said, you're it. You're the one I've been looking for. You're my perfect companion, my completer, my helper, my friend, my lover. Solomon said this about wives. He said, when a man finds a wife, he has found a good thing. He's found a treasure. He went on to say this. He said, who can find a virtuous and capable wife? She's more precious than rubies. Great, she will greatly enrich his life. Every man in this room who has been blessed by a wife, understands that verse. And yet, when the Apostle Paul was writing his first letter to the Corinthian church, he said, I wish that you were all single as I am. He went on to say, it is better to remain unmarried. Now, how could he say that? I mean, if God said at the very beginning, it's not good for man to be alone, and, and Peter said, I wish you were all single like I am, why did he say that? Well, I believe the reason is because Paul knew about this coming persecution that was about to take place. He knew that, that a great persecution was going to come on the church. He said this. He said, those who get married now will have trouble, and I'm trying to spare you. Paul knew how difficult it would be to watch someone you love face this persecution. And yet, I believe that marriage can be a great blessing to us even as we go through difficult times, even as we face persecution, if we are both growing in the Lord and we're both growing in our love for one another. I believe that if we are doing those two things, when we're facing the difficulties of life, we can encourage one another to remain faithful even in the difficult times. So as Peter is getting to this part of this letter, this letter that he is writing to churches who are facing immense persecution, he takes a few moments and he begins to talk about the relationship between a husband and a wife. Now before we jump into this passage, I want to give to you what I believe the Bible says is the key to a biblical marriage. It's found in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21. Chapter 5 of Ephesians is this great passage where the Bible tells us that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And he tells us that wives are to submit to their husbands as unto the Lord. And, and we all know those passages. But in Ephesians chapter 5, tw verse 21, Paul said this. He said, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You see, the key to a successful marriage is mutual submission. It's not just about a wife submitting to her husband, but it's about a husband submitting to his wife. Last week, we, we talked about submission, and, and I told you that submission is all about yielding, giving up control for the sake of someone else. And I told you that that's hard to do, isn't it? And I think we all agreed that it's hard for each and every one of us to do that. It's hard to turn a loose of our desires and focus on the desires of someone else. And yet in every area of life, whatever our role is, there will be times 
that we are called to submit. There are going to be times that we're called to surrender what we want for the sake of someone else. And Paul says in Ephesians 5.21 that we do this out of reverence for Christ. And that word reverence in the Greek there is the word phobios, which means fear. What Paul was saying is we do this, we mutually submit to one another because of our holy fear, our respect for our Lord. Now listen, marriage is not about having someone serve you. It's not about having someone wait on you. It's not about having someone meet your needs. Marriage is all about you being willing to serve someone else to wait on someone else, to meet someone else's needs, your spouse's needs, period, end of story. That's what marriage is all about. That means that in marriage, we put aside our selfish, self-centered wants and desires for the sake of our spouse. But you need to understand something about submission. Submission is a choice. Submission is not a right to be demanded. Submission is a gift to be given. And when we give that gift, when we give up our desires, our wants, our wills, for the sake of our spouses, we discover what marriage can be, what God wants marriage to be, when a man and a woman mutually give of themselves out of their love for God and out of their love for one another. And it's then and only then that I believe that a couple can discover the kind of marriage God wants, a marriage that really is made in heaven. And if your Bibles are open to 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter addresses both wives and husbands in this passage, but he begins with some wise words for wives. So I want you to listen up to what he says in verses 1 and 2. He says, in the same way, let me stop there because I want to remind you that that phrase, in the same way, takes us back to chapter 2. And it takes us back to what what Peter said in the preceding verses in chapter 2. And if you recall, he was talking about Jesus and how Jesus submitted to the Father's will and went to the cross for your sake and for my sake. And then after he says that, Peter says, in the same way, you wives must accept the authority or submit to your husbands. Then even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Now, before I get into this passage, I want to talk to you who are single. This passage is about those who are married. But if you were single, God has a word for you. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I believe it's verses 14 and following. Paul says this. He says, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. And then he says this, he says, what fellowship hath light with darkness? And so what Paul is saying to those of you who are not married, who are Christians, he's saying to you that if you get married, you must marry a Christian. You can't marry a non-Christian. You would be unequally yoked. Your spouse would be living through one biblical or one worldview. You would be living through another worldview. Your spouse would have one God, the God of this world, and you would have another God, the one true God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that would create all kinds of problems in your life. And so the Bible makes it clear, if we are saved and we are single and we want to get married, then we need to make sure that we marry a believer. But here in this passage, Peter is talking to people who are already married. And you need to understand in this context, Peter is talking to people who got saved after they got married. And Peter is talking to women who got saved after they got married and their husbands did not get saved. Now, anytime a Christian is married to a non-Christian, if that Christian is really a Christian and really loves Jesus and that person is lost, it's going to create problems. It's going to create tension. It's going to create friction in the relationship. But in the New Testament, it posed a number of significant problems. One New Testament scholar said this. He said the wife's position was far more difficult than the husband. 
If a husband became a Christian, he would automatically bring his wife with him into the church. But if a wife became a Christian while her husband did not, she was taking a step that was unprecedented and which produced the acutest problem. What that scholar is saying is, if a husband became a Christian in the culture, the wife would automatically follow him to the church, would hear the gospel, and many times, perhaps most of the time, would give their life to Jesus when they heard the good news. But it wasn't that case, and it wasn't that way when a wife came to faith in Christ. You see, in that culture, just because a wife came to faith in Christ didn't mean that the husband would follow her. Oftentimes, he would be opposed to her faith in Christ because he was a Roman, he was a Greek, and, and he served and worshipped many gods, and now she was worshipping a different god. And so it would create all of these problems in the relationship. But into this, Peter said something that is absolutely amazing. He spoke to, to something that I think happened not only then, but it happens now. You see, when any of us come to faith in Christ, really get saved, I mean, we really get saved, we want people we love and know to come to faith in Christ. We want them to get saved, would you agree? I mean, when Jesus changes your life, you want him to change the life of the people you know and love. And so if a, if a woman comes to faith in Christ and she's married to a husband that does not know Christ, what is she going to do? She's going to start talking to him about Jesus. And she's going to start talking to him about Jesus. And she's going to start talking to him about Jesus. And oftentimes, her zealous communication to her husband will create all kinds of problems. And to that, Peter says something. He says, wives, you need to understand that your godly life speaks louder than your loudest voice. Let me say that again. Peter is saying to a wife who is a Christian married to a non-Christian, he is saying, your godly life is going to speak louder than your loudest voice could ever speak. And that doesn't mean that, that this wife never shares verbally with her husband that is lost, but what it does mean is that she is wise and selective in what she says and, and how she says it and when she says it. Now, in these two first verses here, Peter makes it clear to us that submission isn't conditional. No, I've met wives who say things like this. Well, I would submit to my husband if he was more like so-and-so's husband. Or, I've heard wives say this. When my husband starts living like he's supposed to live and he starts being the husband he's supposed to live, be, then I will be the wife I'm supposed to be. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that a wife doesn't submit to her husband when he's Prince Charming. The Bible doesn't say that a wife submits to her husband when he's pursuing Christ. The Bible simply says here that a wife is to submit to her husband, to accept the authority of her husband. That, that phrase there is the Greek word submit. And then it says, even if they refuse to obey the good news, even if they are disobedient to the word. Peter is talking to women whose husbands are going their own way. They care nothing about the things of God. They may even mock the things of God. And yet Peter says to the wife who is a follower of Jesus, submit to your husband. Ladies, you need to listen very carefully. It's not your responsibility to get your husband to obey. It's your responsibility to obey what God tells you and leave your husband to God. And so you let your godly life speak to your husband. And then Peter says this. He says, and your family is watching you. Now here Peter is specifically talking about your unsaved husband, your unbelieving husband. But the reality is that your entire family is watching you if you're the one in your family who is a believer. And, and so in the context of a wife, he's, he's saying, are you going to be a nagging, manipulative, whining, a self-centered wife? Or are you going to be a wife that shows a pure and reverent life? Now that word reverent there, it's the same Greek word that is used in Ephesians 5.21. It's the Greek word phobios or fear. And so what Peter is saying there is are you going to live a pure life that's the result of the fear of God in your life? Ladies, listen. You aren't submissive to your husbands and pure because you fear your husbands. 
You are submissive and pure because you have a holy fear of God that causes you to want to live a life of obedience, trusting God with your life. And this is what's crazy here. Peter tells us that the behavior of that wife, the way she acts, the way she lives, will make such an impact on her husband that that by itself can draw that husband to Christ. Ladies, listen to me. If you're here this morning and you have an unsaved husband, you need to understand that it's your life of purity and submission that's going to draw your husband to Jesus. It's not your words. It's not your job to save your husband. That's God's job. It's your job to love your husbands. Now listen to what it says in verses 3 and 4. Peter says, don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. Now, in these verses, Peter is drawing a contrast between inner beauty and outward beauty. And as he does, he isn't saying that a woman can't wear jewelry or a woman can't care about her hair or a woman can't wear nice clothes. He's not saying that. But rather, he is saying that real beauty is not what is on the outside, but rather what is on the inside. What I've discovered is that inner beauty that comes from a heart that is fully surrendered to God changes the outward beauty. You see, there is a beauty that never fades. It never grows old. It isn't tarnished by the change of the color of our hair or our, the loss of teeth or, or the wrinkles on our face. It is a beauty that weather cannot decay and time cannot change. It's a beauty that gets better with age. And that's the beauty, Peter says, of a gentle and quiet spirit. And so what Peter says here is focus on inner beauty more than outward beauty. Now, for some, outward beauty doesn't take much time. I've seen ladies that can make themselves beautiful as they're driving to work in their car. Last week, really about, I guess, a week and a half ago, I was driving home after being at the church, and, and I, I was on the road I was on. There was a car in front of me, and it was swerving on the road. And I was right behind it, and I was thinking, what in the world is this? Are, are these people in this car drinking? Are they drunk? And I kind of got myself on, you know, I was on, my, on the fence because I, I, I wanted to make sure that they didn't do something crazy and cause us to get in a wreck together. And so when we got at the, the light, they were turning left, and I was going straight. So I went up beside this car, and it was this woman putting on her lipstick. And I thought to myself, I hope she doesn't hit a pothole when she starts back driving. I mean, that'd get real mad, mad, messy, wouldn't it? And, and there's some people that, I mean, they can make themselves outwardly beautiful in no amount of time. But the Bible tells us that there is a beauty that's more important than that. Last week, my wife was in sick. She was sick in bed all week. Uh, for a whole week, she never put on makeup. She never washed her hair. She was miserable all week long. And at one point, she went into the bathroom. She looked into the mirror, and she honestly said to me, I'm sorry you have to look at this. And I looked at her, and I said, what are you talking about? You are the most beautiful woman in the world. And I meant it with everything within me. Because she has been working on that beauty since she was seven years old and she gave her life to Jesus. And her beauty isn't coming from the makeup that she puts on or the hairdo she has or the dress she's wearing or, the, or the, the, um, anything else she's got. It's coming from inside of her. And that's what Peter says a woman needs to focus on, the beauty that comes from a gentle and quiet spirit now ladies listen Peter's not telling us that you shouldn't mess with your hair he's not saying don't wear nice clothes he's not saying don't wear makeup or jewelry but what he is saying is those things are secondary don't let those things define you 
Don't let when you look in the mirror define what you look like. There are more important things than that. And then listen to what he says in verses 5 and 6. He says, this is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They trusted God and accepted the authority of their husbands. They submitted to their husbands. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband, Abraham, called him her master. You are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. Now, I want you to notice a phrase there. It's that phrase, they trusted God. Now, the word trust here is not the word normally translated trust, pistos or pisto in the Bible. It's a word that, that literally means hope or expectation. What Peter is saying here is that the holy women of old didn't put their hope in their husbands, but rather they put their hope in God as they submitted their lives to their husbands and even called them masters. Listen very carefully. It's God, not your husband, who will meet your greatest desires. And so what Peter is saying here is don't be afraid of what will happen if you submit. Don't be afraid of what will happen if you yield to your husband, if you treat him like the king of your household. Don't be afraid that he will take advantage of you. I've got your back. That's what God is saying. God is saying, put your hope in me, not your husband, and I will take care of you. Now, why is this so difficult? I mean, why is this, this issue of submission, I mean, even difficult to good, godly Bible-believing women, and, and I don't want you to raise your hand, but let's, let's just be real. I mean, this is a difficult thing. People struggle with submission. And I believe it's something that, that's been a struggle since the very first family. I think the answer to this struggle can be found in the first book of the Bible, in the first family. In Genesis chapter 3, after sin entered the world and, and it messed up everything, God was talking to Adam and Eve, and he was talking to them about the consequences of the choices that they made. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, God said this to Eve. Listen to what he said. He said, then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth. And then listen to what it says, and you will desire to control your husband. Did you hear that? God said to Eve, because of sin, your desire is going to be to control your husband, but he will rule over you. Now that word desire, it's only found one more other place in the Old Testament. It's found in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 7. Notice what it says there. It says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. And then listen to what it says about sin. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Sin is longing to control you, but you must control those desires and not let them control you. Listen, if you are a lady and you long to be in charge in your home, the reason is sin. And don't get mad at me. Get mad at Eve. And get mad at God. Because God is the one who told us that's the result of sin. But here's what you need to understand. If you're a Christian, you've been redeemed. You've been bought with a price. Jesus shed his blood so that sin no longer has to have control over you. And so you don't have to have that attitude. You can submit. Now what does biblical submission look like? Let me give you quickly five things. First, I believe biblical submission is allowing your husband to lead. Ladies, hear me. If you fight against your husband's leadership, many men will move to the recliner and disengage. And you don't want that. I want you to hear me. If you fight against your husband's leadership, many men aren't going to fight you. They're going to just disengage. They're going to go to the recliner and be armchair husbands, not doing anything. It's not going to be good for you. 
it's not going to be good for your family. Second, treat your husband with respect. What that means is you don't correct him in public. You don't point out his failures before people. Ladies, you need to understand that us men, we have fragile egos. We really do. And you can tear our ego up in a heartbeat. And so you don't criticize us in public. As a matter of fact, I believe the Bible teaches that God wants you to be our greatest cheerleaders. You need to be the one who cheers us on. Third, share your feelings with him without attacking him. If you attack your husband, your husband is going to do one of two things depending on his personality. He's going to attack you back, and that's going to be ugly. Or he's going to withdraw, and that's not going to be good. Fourth, don't replay his failures. He already knows them. When your husband messes up or makes a wrong decision, thank him for wanting to be the leader in your household. I heard about these two men who were talking about an argument that the one man was having with his wife. And and the man said, whenever my wife and I have an argument, she gets historical. And the other man said, historical? You mean hysterical? He said, oh no, I mean historical. Every time we get in an argument, she reminds me of everything I've ever done wrong. And there are some women like that. But I tell you that if you do that, it's going to cause your husband to disengage. And finally, reinforce his positive behavior. When he does something good, let him know. And that's how wives mutually submit. But then Peter gives us wise words for husbands. He gives us that in verse 7. Now, time out. I know some of you women right now, you're counting. One, two, three, four, five, six. You mean he gave me six verses? And he's only given my husband one verse? That's not fair. Well, ladies, trust me. What what God says in that one verse is more than enough to make up for what he said to you in those six verses. So, So listen to what he said. He says, in the same way, you husbands. Now, let me stop for just a second. Remember chapter 3, verse 1, when he said, in the same way, you wives, and it went back to Jesus and how Jesus submitted to the Father's will and took sin upon himself. And Peter said to wives, in the same way, just like Jesus, you submit to your husbands. Now Jesus is going back to husbands, and he says, in the same way, remember what Jesus did, husbands, in the same way you Husbands, must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. Now, Peter gives men three things they need to do. The first thing he says is men are to honor our wives. And that word honor, it literally means extreme value when you honor something it's speaking of something that has extreme value and to help you understand how much value this word that is translated honor in chapter 3 verse 7 is also found in chapter 1 verse 19 and it's translated there with the word precious and it's talking about the precious blood of Jesus and so what Peter is saying is just as the blood of Jesus is precious it's of great value to all of us your wife is to be of great value to you remember what Solomon said he said your wife is a treasure so how do we honor how do we treat our wives as valuable treasures Well, first, we protect her. We protect her from the devil. We protect her from this world. We protect her from harm as much as we can. We protect her from the sorrow and pain that comes in this world as much as we can. Second, we keep her safe. Now, how is that different than protect? Well, when you have something of great value, you want to keep it safe. Oftentimes, you keep it in a safe. You want to make sure that that nobody steals it. You want to make sure that that no one comes and destroys it. You want to take care of it. And so we keep our wives safe. And then we cherish our wife. 
we treat her like the prize gift she is. And if she is a prize gift, we don't expect her to wait on us. No, we, we flip that around and we wait on her. Men, listen to me. If you think you married your wife so that you can serve her or she can serve you, and you've missed it. You married your wife so that you can serve her. And so Peter says, honor your wives. Next, he says, know your wives. He tells us to treat our wives with understanding or live with her in an understanding way. The Greek word is literally according to knowledge. Peter is telling us that we need to go to school on our wives. Now, understand, you can read books on women. You can read books on wives. And there are some good books out there. I mean, one that I would recommend if you've never read it and you're married or you want to be married is a book by Willard Harley. It's called His Needs, Her Needs. It's an incredible book that I think talks about the, the greatest needs of a woman, the greatest needs of a man. And it's a really good book. But what you need to understand is God didn't make your wife with a cookie cutter. She is fearfully and wonderfully made. Your wife is a unique masterpiece created just for you. And I know some people disagree with this, but I believe with all my heart that, that God has someone unique and special for each and every one of us if we're supposed to be married. And so for me, for me I believe before I was ever born, before my wife was ever born, God already had in his mind to create her for me. And when she was born five years after I was born, he began to prepare her to be my wife, the one that was perfectly made for me. You say, you really believe God has someone perfect just for you? Oh, yes, I do. And I think the tragedy is all too often people, people get in a hurry and they miss out on God's very best because they long to get married without waiting for God's best but men your wives are unique masterpieces just for you so get to know her you have to study her you have to find out what makes her tick you need to find out what she likes what she doesn't like you need to find out what her needs are you need to find out what makes her happy what makes her sad you need to discover how she can best grow in her relationship with Jesus because we all learn, we all grow in different ways. And by the way, that's what intimacy is. Intimacy is when we get to know someone at the deepest level. Someone said intimacy is into me see. When we see people at the very deepest level. You see, intimacy isn't sexual. But intimacy often results in sex. Intimacy is when you know someone at a deep, personal level like no one else knows them. And so Peter says, know your wives. And then third, he tells men, treat your wives as partners, not property. He starts off telling us that our wives are weaker than us. Now, men, listen to me. He's not talking about intellectually. He's not talking about spiritually. He's just making a statement that wives are weaker than men. Women are weaker than men. Physically, we are. Now, would you all agree with that? I hope you do, because we're not one of those kind of churches. I mean, the, I mean all you have to do, all you have to do. Let me just look here. Let me just look here for just a second. All right, okay. Matt, I want you to stand up. Liz, stand up beside him. Go ahead, stand up, stand up, stand up. Now, Matt's not this big, bulky guy, but uh, you may think you are, Matt, you're not. But, but how many of you think that Liz can take Matt? I mean, she can take him down. I don't think so either. Now, she may be able to take Matt down, I <laughs> See, Liz is not going to be able to take Matt down because God created Matt different. 
He's got more muscle mass. He's got more strength than she does. Men are created different. Y'all can sit down. Are created different than women. Men are stronger than women. And that's why it's so ludicrous today when, when all of these people are saying that, that men who think they're women should be able to compete against women in sports. That's stupid. And if you bought into that kind of stupidity, then let's have, a, let's have a talk over coffee. Because you need to come back to sanity. And that's not just biblical, that's common sense. We're made different. And that's what Peter is saying here. Men are stronger than women. But then he goes on to say, but we're equal partners in this new life that God has given us. You see... Even though we have different roles, even though we have different responsibilities, in our relationship, we are equals before God. Now, men may be called to lead in the family, but we are called to lead with a partner right beside us. And so what that means is as you lead men, there are going to be times that your wife has a better word than you do. And you need to have the discernment to recognize, wow, my wife is speaking truth here. I need to listen to her. And you make the decision that you're right. This is what we need to do. And you need to follow her in that. Are you called to lead? Yes, you're called to lead. But in that moment, you recognize that your wife is the one who is better in this, knows more in this, has a word from the Lord that you have not yet received, maybe. Doesn't mean you're not called to lead. You are, but you lead as equal partners. Now, as Peter wraps this up, he gives a promise to both husbands and wives, and it's powerful. He said the very last part of verse 7, notice what he says. He says, so your prayers will not be hindered. And, And this goes not just for men. It goes back to, Verse 1, where it says, in the same way you wives, you do this. And then he says, in the same way you men do this. And then he says to wives and husbands, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Peter tells us that when our marriages are not where they need to be, our prayers will not be as powerful as we long for them to be. I wonder how many prayers are hindered because of marital disharmony. Oh, you need to get your relationship right if you want your prayers to be powerful. Now, in closing, what I want to say to you is this. If you're married, the greatest thing that you can give to your spouse right now is a relationship with Jesus. Love Jesus with all your heart. Pursue Jesus with all your strength. Surrender to him with everything you've got. That's the greatest gift that you can give your husband. That's the greatest gift that you can give your wife. And if you're here, you've never given your life to Jesus as a husband or a wife. And I challenge you today. God has you here because you need Jesus to be the kind of husband or the kind of wife you need to be. And if you're here today and you're not married and you're wondering why in the world did I come today? I can tell you the reason you're here today is because God loves you so very much that he knew I was going to tell you that you need to give your life to Jesus. And he wants a relationship with you. And he's longing for you to humble yourself and surrender your life to him. So if you're here, married or not married, and you've never given your life to Jesus, give your life to him today. Now, As we get ready to close, I want us to all stand. So all stand. And if your husband is here, wife, if your wife is here, husband, I want you to get beside them right now. If they're not here, I get it. If you're not married, I understand. You can pray. You can put this into practice. Um, If your husband isn't here, you can pray. But if your spouse is here, I want you to do something right now. And I want you to hold hands. I want you to hold hands. And husbands, I want you to look your wife in the eye. And I want you to tell her from a heart that longs to live for Jesus, I desire to be the husband God wants me to be.
tell your wife that right now. Now, wives, I want you to look at your husband. And with honesty from a heart that desires to live for Jesus, I want you to tell your husband right now, I desire to be the wife God wants me to be. And here's what I want you to do if you're married. I want you for just a moment, husbands, to pray for your wife, pray for your family. And when I say pray for them, pray for them so that they can hear you pray. And so I want you to take a moment and do that right now. Father God, my desire this morning is that you will use our church family to help build strong families, to help build strong marriages. And Father, I know that there are some here today who have were going through divorces, some very painful divorces, some who have been hurt and broken in a very bad marriage. And Father, I pray for them that, Lord, that we will, Lord, prepare them, if it's your desire that they ever get married again, Lord, to to find that husband or wife that will love them the way you love them. Father, I know that the enemy is attacking the home. He's been attacking the home since the very beginning. And so, Lord, we need to strengthen the home. Help us to do that. I pray for every husband here. I pray for every wife here. Put a hedge of protection around them. Keep them holy. Keep them pure. Help them to love you with all of their heart and love one another with your love. I pray that they will love each other so much (laughs) that their neighbors, their co-workers, the people that they do life with will see a difference in them and in their marriage and I pray this father in Jesus name amen now here's what I want us to do with